Welcome to Directed Life, the show to help kingdom-minded creative entrepreneurs find, fund, and fulfill their calling to flip culture upside down. I'm your host, Cap Chatfield. Today, our guest is Stephen, also known as Steve Robertson. He is the CEO and founder of Bold Education, and this guy is a kingdom warrior. And what we're going to be talking about today is everything from his serial entrepreneurship uh, background, work experience, to talking with people in the NFL about his experience and what he's seeing as the future of education, particularly for Gen Z. And what we're also going to be talking about is specifically how to treat Gen Z as a mission field and how to communicate to them, not just from a business perspective, but as a ministry, from a ministry perspective, as we move forward in the years to come. So Steve, it's so exciting to, first of all, call you a new friend to connect with you. And thank you so much for joining us on Directed Life today. Thank you, Cap. I'm excited for this conversation and uh, even more excited that this is a stirred interest with you. As you know how passionate I am about the next generation and whenever I find people that start to see what they bring to the table, I I get really pumped for a conversation. So thank you for having me on. You bet. Well, I said this on the pre-show call. You are, uh, you're an interesting guy. I'm already thinking like, man, you're like, you're like the James Bond of education. You got the (laughs) the English accent and you, you, you also, it's so clear that you have some amazing business acumen. And so before we talk about what you're doing now, why don't you share with us a little bit about your experience with entrepreneurship and business building? Wow, thank you. So um, really passionate about business, always have been, just really being blessed. God's given me such favor in that space, way above kind of my personal intellect, isn't it always the case, right? And so um, we, my family and I, um, we immigrated to the States 23 years ago, sold a business that we had in in, in South Africa. And um it was in the sports industry, tennis primarily, tennis uh, coaching business, and um, moved over to the States here um, and had been involved in a business that um, that is really very entrepreneurial. It's not just the business, but it's the, 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 the I guess, the attitude that we've brought to business. And so um, I've always been incredibly fortunate and passionate to come alongside people that are the entrepreneurial and visionary. And so that's really rubbed off on me and inspired me. So I really um, pursue entrepreneurial pursuits, pursue pursuits, how about that? Um, But also have just been really lucky to come alongside some really young people as they're kind of going through their formative years and run with them on that kind of entrepreneurial journey. So for me, um, that is that is kind of what what drives me, and that's why I'm probably not in full time ministry. It's because I've always feel like it's been a it's been entrepreneurial building businesses and and using that for the kingdom, and uh, more so than than full time ministry. Sorry, that was a bit of a tangent. Forgive me for that. But um, so yeah, and and building businesses and connecting with other businesses, I've been fortunate to partner with like really prestigious universities and and other organizations um, over the years, and so. Yeah, that that is what I what I live, eat, and sleep. I love the perspective of how you can leverage skill sets that you know might have been used in secular or contexts where maybe God wasn't even invited. And I'm not saying that He wasn't in your scenario, but it's I just love how God will use all of it, all of it for His kingdom purposes. And you know, as we even kicked off this show, this show is specifically for people that God has given very creative or entrepreneurial vision for that have this hunger of, you know what, it's, I know that God's called me to build his kingdom, but it's not supposed to be in the four walls of a church. And it's, and he's calling me to go out into the marketplace and create systems and infrastructures and organizations and network with people that, you know, that's where the mission field is. And that's where I'm called to go. And so I'd love for you to talk about uh, bold education, this, this, uh, this endeavor that you're working on right now, Tell us a little bit about the vision behind it, and if you can intertwine it in that, how you're seeing the bridge between uh, entrepreneurship in education as well as ministry and kingdom building. Yeah, so that's a really, really broad question, Cap, but thank you for, for asking. So, um, old education for all intents and purposes um, is a summer program. We offer summer programming. And in the last couple of years, um, that hasn't been the case, basically because of COVID, because the bulk of our programming, all of our programming, is run at universities. And so 
to give you a sense of scope, we would bring thousands of students from more than 100 different countries, last count 140 countries, all over the United States to a whole lot of different universities on um, primarily the East Coast, but all over, right? And we would run either our own programming and or programming partnering with universities. Um, and so um, I'm also involved with another business called ESF Camps. And the, diff the, the real difference there is just the age group of the, 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 the customer base where we have at ESF, we have students that are primar primarily day camp students. So we're talking about a younger age students and that would, we wouldn't run at universities, we run at private schools. So all said and done, the, the, that business, the scope of that business is this past summer, which was a pretty heavy COVID summer from a business perspective, we did over 20,000 weeks of camp and we hired probably close to 1,500 seasonal staff. Um, on a regular summer, we would be about 2,000 seasonal staff and we would be you know, close to 30,000, 40,000 weeks of camp. And so we've got all the who's who, the next world leaders that, that come to some of these programs with us wow. um, at all these different universities, um, Yale and University of Pennsylvania and Villanova and a whole, a whole range of them. And in some cases we have kings and queens and princesses, kids sending their kids, and we have entourages of security guards. We you know, sometimes have, we had the crown prince of Qatar's son came to one of our programs, you know, and so you've got this, we're coming face to face with the next generation of leaders. But what's amazingly cool about it is that we're in a context that isn't school, but yet is an upskill context, right? So this generation lives in a space where upskill is a really big deal. And um, so, we're in this place where we're upskilling them, whether it's tennis, whether it's business, medicine, whether it's robotics, it doesn't really matter. Um, and we also have an invisible curriculum. We may touch on that a little bit later. But hmm. so we've got all these kids that we bring together, right? And um, we have the chance to really pour into them from a character perspective and a growth perspective. And, and these are all secular businesses. So where does the kingdom come into it? You know, we're talking about over the years, tens of thousands of staff that we've employed. And... We have, um, not really by design, but we've had students, uh, staff, sorry, from around the world that have come and worked for us, right? So we're talking about 2,000 staff, you, you're hiring a lot of people, right? And as a result, we end up leveraging relationships that we have to send us people. So I have a really good friend in Brazil, whose name is Tiafalo, and he runs yeah, a thing called doing this great. movement. So T and I are really close, and for a number of years, T has been sending... Um, students that are going through kind of a leadership, and when I say students in this case, I'm talking about college students, um, going through a leadership program with him and, and, and Dunamis Movement, and they would come and spend the summer with us. And so here we have people that are like really focused, for all intents and purposes, really clean cut. And um, we plug them into an organization that has got a whole lot of things figured out, right? And we do what we do well. And just by the nature of these people from Tiafalo, we've got people from South Africa, we've got, you know, that are, that are all just Christian people. They come along and they work and their work ethic is amazing. And what ends up happening is they end up having conversations with other staff members, with kids, and you end up seeing the kingdom come crashing in. And so it's not truly by design, but it is by design, because again, we've got a, we're running a secular program, but it's just a beautiful thing to see where you bring those kind of people with a, their hearts are just open to serve um, into an environment like this, the number of opportunities that they get. And so um, the training we take them through is, is the key to our success in so many ways, and it's kingdom-based, just the concepts and the principles that we, we, we use, even though it is um, obviously a secular business. Um, and the opportunity to kind of, kind of come alongside even the staff that work with us on a one-on-one -on -one basis, the students that you bump into and have a chance to connect with, that's where Kingdom happens because it's in a mentoring kind of relationship capacity. So that's what the bridge looks like for us. Um, and honestly, it's been really effective. A whole lot of lives have been touched and changed over the years. And um, I believe it will continue. Not only students, but staff as well. That's phenomenal. Is that, is that related to what you're doing meeting with, you know, I mean, you just said this to me just a couple of weeks ago, you're like meeting with NFL teams and talking with them about um, what you see as far as connecting with Gen Z. Is there any relation there or is that a separate thing? So um, there's always a relation, right? So um, 
you know, the NFL, there was, there's a group of insiders, uh, all these NFL teams that meet in this specific case, that meet every two weeks and they discuss, you know, the operational and tactical issues of what's going on with their teams and at their stadiums and so on, right? And so um, I had a gentleman who worked for me who was the head of operations for the New York, certain of the New York, the Washington football team that is about to be renamed. And, um, oh, are they going to be renamed? I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, I think I think next week, Tuesday, they're announcing their new name, right? So nice. the Washington football team doesn't roll off the tongue. So no. let's hope the new one does. I think it might be something like the Admirals or who knows, right? We'll see. So he reached out to me and he says to me, Steve, you know what? We're, we have about 1,000, in some cases, 2,000 seasonal staff that work every game day. And we are pulling out our hair. We can't, we can't find them. We can't hire them. We can't keep them. They don't show up. We can't keep our concession stands open. We can't keep our bathrooms clean. And this is impacting the game day experience, the fan experience, and in, in so doing, the experience of the team, right? So would you just come and share some of what you know? Because he's known me in this area of Gen Z and next generation for the last 15 years, right? So he knows that's where my head is. And it's the key to my success as a business, right? Understanding the next generation, their parents, as they graduate high school, them as college students for the most part, that's, if I don't understand them and know how to communicate with them, train them, how to reach them from a marketing perspective, my business doesn't run. So it was amazing, got onto the call, again, a whole lot of secular um, conversation going on when it comes to Gen Z, but again, very godly principle based stuff. Um, and I just started to unpack with them some of the strategies that we use with seasonal staff. And I try to customize a little bit, understanding through their lens what it looks like in game day. Huge football fan, Philadelphia Eagles, Super Bowl champions not that long ago. Um, and, and it was amazing because, and again, this is just truly a God thing because just unpacking that with them, no agenda on my part other than to serve them in some way. And they invited me to their annual conference in um, in May. So that's just amazing. Um, it's just amazing opportunity to to speak into them about the next generation. They were they were blown away by the the perspective that they hadn't understood Gen Z th- through before. And when I take a step back and look at that, that's really just a God thing. God has given mm. me downloads. He's given me insights. He's given me connections and opportunities to just view this generation maybe a little differently than most. And so even if it's just the, the narrative in which I was able to share, um, it touched them and, and in, in a way that they were, they were wanting more, which is just amazing, right? That, that is so amazing. And I love that you gave God the credit, as you probably always do, about this, this revelation. He's really giving you a revelation about the next generation. And, you know, whereas the world can look at the next generation and say, Oh my gosh, it's got to end with this one. Like these, these kids just don't have a clue. You're seeing opportunity where other people are seeing obstacles. And so a question that I'd love to ask you in regards to probably what you talk about with these leaders in the NFL and these other organizations and probably the, the guiding, you know, principle and, and thesis behind your, uh, your summer programs is what's the number one problem with how people think about Gen Z and how should they start thinking about Gen Z? That's, that's, I love that question. Um, so I, I have a, I have a, my first book is about to go to the, it's going to the editor this week, right? And you know how long it takes to actually come out, but we've been working on that book for over three years. And the reason I'm telling you that is not because I, but because the title of the book is Aliens Among Us, Gen Z, <laughs> 10, 10, 10 surprising truths about Gen Z, the disconnected generation. So wow. the aliens among us thing is this. The number one thing that people secular in the Christian space, parents and business just don't get is they don't get that this generation are aliens. And of course, I unpack what that means. I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm trying to catch people's attention to say, You look at these people and it's not just a teenager going through a phase because that's what we write it off to. You know, this generation, the teenagers going through a phase, they better snap out of it because. And so by calling them aliens, what I want people to understand is that unless you have a new lens to look at this generation through, unless you start to understand why I'm calling them aliens and there's. 
there's kind of 16 key things uh, as to why we get to this place of them being aliens. But um, when you get that a revelation of that perspective, at that point, you change your behavior. So the, 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 the concept is if an alien sat in front of you, you would try and figure out how to speak alien. Like, what is it that makes them tick? What do they want to eat? Like, uh, like, and so when you start to do that with this next generation, all of a sudden, all the legacy wisdom and knowledge that you bring to a conversation now goes out of the window and you, you are, you know, you, you're on, on what level terms, right? And so you start to see them in a different way. And as soon as you see them, you start to see the created value and brilliance of God in them. And you just see that this is a creative, innovative, dynamic, smart, crazy, awesome generation. And it's not just them on their phones, right? There's just so much more to it. And you also start to understand that this isn't a choice that they've chosen to be. They have, in essence, been wired differently by really four things that I call the perfect storm. So this perfect storm has hit and it's caused them to be wired differently. And that's why they're behaving like they're behaving. And in fact, if you read the whole book at the end, we are the aliens, not them. And they are already being changed by our world and changing our world. Um, I saw you quoted 35% of um, the communication is digital, right? 35% of the communication is digital and it's going to be more. The interesting fact is not that 35% of the communication is digital. It is that 35% of our communication is not yet digital, right? So there's the crux. The world is changing. Because they've known no other world, they changed before us. That's the essence of what's going on here. Wow. And we slowly are going to continue to change and catch up. And what we're seeing when we look at them is the foreshadowing of what's going to be the the norm, right? So I hope, did that make some sense? Yeah, uh, it did. Do you have any more to expound on that? or you? It's just so much. You have no idea, right? So um, uh, it's, it's fascinating. Um, one of the biggest like shifts, mind shifts is once you see a generation differently, um, you'll engage with them differently. And I think one of the biggest, one of the biggest shifts, which is kind of a complicated concept. So do, do you mind if I dive into it? It's a little Please. weird. Okay. Yeah. Is, this is, is this okay? what we're here for. So there's a, there's the story of SOS, right? SOS started back in the day originally, um, primarily with ships trying to send out a distress signal, right? And so um, what happened back in the day in the 1900s, <laughs> that sounds like a long time ago, right? The I early know, 1900s, right? <laughs> 1908, something like that. Um, there, were, there were all these countries that went, when they, were, they had their own way of sharing a, a distress signal should they be in distress, right? And what they found out really quickly was that when you're in, in international waters, it's like the Tower of Babylon. Everyone's speaking a different language, right? So... This is fascinating, listen to this. And so at some point along the line, um, they started to try and find this, this system to, to use that was common. And actually the Germans came up with a Morse code, dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, 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 whatever the, the thing is standing for SOS, right? But listen to this fun story. So when the Titanic hit the iceberg, all the hardware on the Titanic was installed by this um, Marconi, I think it's called Marconi, I forget the name of the name, Marconi, this Italian company or business. And the people that operated it, when it hit the iceberg, were using the Marconi system. I think it's called Q, uh, CQD was their system. I think is that, that's what it was called, right? So here they, they hit the iceberg. The people that are operating the stuff are using CQD to try and share that the fact that they're in distress. And somebody else on the bridge said, hey, guys, you really should try the international version, version, which they then did. And they did SOS. And at that point, they, you know, people were notified. So the story goes in my head, imagine if they used SOS immediately. So what's this whole SOS thing? So the whole thing about this SOS is it's a call. It's a distress call. And where we are right now is we're in a, a place of distress. And this is why we're in distress, because everybody who's not Gen Z, the leaders and parents primarily are so used to the third industrial revolution style of thinking. Mm -hmm. This is what you do, how to get this result. There's a thing called sage on stage, SOS. That's the whole connection of the SOS, right? So what we have is we have the sage on stage who stands up and says, this is how you need to do things. 
This is my way. This is what's worked. This is how our company does it. And in an in a education perspective, the professor who stands in front of the class and says, you've come here to learn all my knowledge right. and sit quietly and I'll tell it to you. And so the biggest transition from a leader and a parent perspective is this sage on stage mentality. I've lived in this world a long time. I know a lot and I'm going to tell you what it is and how it is. The shift is to a GPS. We all know what a GPS does, right? Mm -hmm. It gets us to the right place. Sometimes I don't listen to my to ways and ugh, I should, right? Mm. So a GPS is a guide positioned by the side. And so from a from a a mentoring perspective, that shift is massive. So you've got the sage on stage and the guide position by the side. And so what you really have to do is you have to allow, imagine the Titanic is a business. You have to understand that you're going to hit that iceberg. And if you're using the wrong code, source code, you are not going to be able to communicate very well what you need to communicate. So all that is to say this, um, that where we are today is we need to learn how to lay down all our weaknesses, all our legacy knowledge, all our bad practices, and cap, and our good ones. We need to lay them down as leaders, right? And when I come alongside you, Cap, in a specific situation, what bubbles up is what you need at that specific moment. So my strength that I need to bring to a conversation with you then bubbles up, right? And so what I'm not doing is bringing preconceived ideas and, and solutions to a conversation before it started in any style of leadership, in any style of, style of communication. And this concept is really like big, so forgive me for giving you just a, a, a high no, kind of flyby. This is amazing. Um, but that's the biggest shift is that leaders, even and parents, even church leaders have to put away all of that. And inherently what happens is everything we've learned and done what will happen is it'll bubble up appropriately at the right time if you take the time to do individualized, customized, on-demand, one-on-one leadership. And that's really what this is about. This is about a shift back to a leadership style concept that we've all known as the right way mm -hmm. to come alongside somebody properly without an agenda. And that's where we really start to see um, not only in our business, but I know this is what, what the future is calling for. That's where you start to see a generation come into their own in a way that will blow all our minds. So, look, that was all over the place. Forgive me. I hope that made some sense and you could track with that. I, I did actually track with that a lot. One of the things that stuck out to me pretty interestingly was the third industrial revolution comment. I'm literally today had just finished a recording. Uh, we were shooting a podcast with one of our clients. They're called Skill Work. And they're a travel staffing agency for skilled workers across the country. So you can imagine the skilled the skilled labor deficit in America is just growing astronomically because we live in such a archaic mindset of how college, like how how to be valuable in the marketplace. Go to get a four year degree, um, and then you know rack up a ton of student loan debt, and then you're valuable in the marketplace with a gender studies degree, which is not going to pay off your debt. Um, but meanwhile, there's all of these jobs available. Trade school is super affordable and you can be making a six figure salary really in no time with a, with a trade school job. And the episode that we did today was actually called the fourth industrial revolution leading through the fourth industrial revolution because our client, one thing that they figured out is how this next generation even looks at work is so fundamentally different from how previous gener generations have, where you have a job, you stick with that job in that company for decades and decades. And now, especially, I'd love your, your you know, feel free to go on a rabbit, rabbit down a rabbit hole or tangent with how COVID has even accelerated that whole, that whole shift into this new generation is like, this next generation has tasted and seen what it looks like to work autonomously. I get to choose who I work for, what hours I work, and I work at home in my pajamas. And and I'm the I'm the competitive commodity here. I, people are bidding for me to do, you know, and I could change my job literally on my phone today. I could switch from working for your company for somebody else. And the companies that that don't embrace this new shift, but just hold on for dear life, hoping that it'll return to the way that it used to be, they're the ones who are going to get lost. And so your your analogy about us being the, the aliens now is so interesting, but that's 
Anyway, I'd love for you to just take that somewhere, but that's wow. it, 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 it's okay. all interconnected. In essence, we're talking about the fourth industrial revolution in one component of the four components that make up what I call a perfect storm, which is technology, right? And mm-hmm. so, uh, we could I could spend two days talking <laughs> that through with you, you know, on, on levels as you can't imagine. But so we're talking about four things. We're talking about technology. We're talking about world news. Believe it or not, right? So there's a thing called, well, let me let me say this. It's called Mean World Syndrome, right? And so. Mean World Syndrome was studied in the 1900s, in 1970 something, okay, uh, in the 1970. And in essence, what it means or, or what it speaks to is an irrational fear of the world outside, right? So you have, you have this irrational fear of everything that's going on in the world, and it's brought to you by screens, in essence, right? So, so television in the 70s and all the screens we're on right now. So when I unpack that more, you'll see why that is a separate component. The third component is social media. Social media is not just a tool, it's a communication, it's a language. And the fourth is parenting and leadership. So those four things wrapped up in a bow and uh, is is the, the perfect storm. And the fourth industrial, industrial revolution is a significant part of that. But listen to this, you touched on something so fascinating, right? Trade, school, university, I mean, listen to this. Ernest and, uh, no, no, World, World Economic Forum did a study and students entering sixth grade or middle school this year, who entered middle school this year in September, 65% of them, Cap, will be working in jobs that do not exist today. Ugh. Okay, that is, That's crazy. That once that sinks in, you'll be like, wait, what? How do I future-proof not only my business, but how do I future-proof my children? How do I future-proof my employees? So when you talk about companies oh, that are resisting God. these changes, when you're talking, when you speak about companies that don't understand what it is to be in the gig economy now, um, when you, when all they do is like, oh, resignation nation, what's going on with this place? Well, there's a, there is a component to that, but th- there's just so much more to it than that, right? That's when you realize that they're still looking at, um, for want of a better term, this world and this generation as, oh, teenagers going through this a phase. Mm-hmm. In the same way you can say about the world, they're like, oh, no, 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 the, it'll come around, it'll come around. Well, no, it, it's not gonna come around because it's changing, right? And the thing is, um, when you look at the rate of change, right, um, there is a, Moore's law talks about the rate of change, specifically in a transistor or in a chip, right? So, transistor, I guess. And so, the doubling time in the capacity within that chip, right? And so, Moore's law measures that. I'm butchering Moore's law a little bit, just saying, when you look at the doubling time of technology, you start to realize that what we've all heard about has now happened. So how doubling time works is this. Imagine I'm building a computer. I build this computer and I have the ability to, on a day-by-day basis, increase its RAM and its functioning capacity, right? So day one, I have this computer, I double the RAM. Turn it on, all excited because I'm a geek and I'm like, oh, I can't wait to see. But like, no, oh, it's okay, it's a little bit different. And that happens the next day. I double the capacity, double the capacity. One day, I turn it on and I'm like, whoa, what just happened? That just blew my mind, right? Yeah. That's where we are right now. And so a lot of people are in the place where they don't understand that this buildup has been somewhat gradual, but we are now seeing the impact and effect of it. And because the way the world is so kind of siloed and fragmented, you don't always see it until it's seen. Okay, so that sounds really ambiguous, right? If you're working in an ind- a specific industry, you become much more aware of this innovative change and the rate of change. But if you're just kind of a secular person doing your thing, you don't always see it and understand and know it. So it's, it's fascinating. So you look at companies and you say, the leaders that are starting to realize that we're in a new era, the leaders that are starting to realize that there's something different and trying to understand what is it and what do I need to do to stay future-proofed and to upskill my employees, Those are the ones that are ahead of the curve, right? This is the first generation that is going to put, and thanks to COVID, an entire group of businesses, schools, products out of business, never to return again. And they are already determining what will be the next flavor that we want. And so there's a lot to get your head around um, as a business owner. I did a a seminar for, for a business engineering business, some amazing things. And the guy said to me at the end of it, Steve, that was amazing. I'm like, he said, but you know what? Um, I'm about 10 years away from retiring. I don't have a lot of Gen Z that in my business, I'm just gonna wing it and, and take a chance. And I'm like, 
I hear you, you know, more power to you, good luck and be strong. Why? Because what it, the energy and effort it takes from a leader, from a parent to do this well mm. is unlike anything we've done before. There's a guy whose name is Bruce Tulgan. He's a business coach. He said something like, um, we're going, th- we've been going through an epidemic of under management. And that's the point. So we've got, we've got so lazy that we've just allowed from a leadership, parenting, whatever perspective, people to self, you know, self manage and grow. Right. And are you saying, are you saying that we're coming out of that or we're in that right now? We're in that. And so as a result, when you look at what's going to be required today and tomorrow to make yourself, your business, your children, your parent, the parenting process successful, it's a complete shift. You have to come into alignment to be this GPS, a guide positioned by the side. And that takes energy and effort, right? If I'm running with you, Cap, every time before we meet, I've got to get a sense of like, where was he? Where is he going? What skills do I need to, to help him understand and discover on this journey? So it's like, it's hard work. And most managers, leaders, parents are just like, uh, they'll figure it out. Well, they won't. That's the point. I'm living that right now because our business is fully remote. So our team, we have a team member, literally she's on like the background right now. She's in LA or she's in Chicago right now, but uh, she's from LA. Uh, Part of my team member, some of my team members live in Nebraska and Omaha. They live within a 25 mile radius, but I don't even see them in person hardly ever because we do everything remotely. We have a couple other team members that are in Finland, a handful that that are in Brazil. We have our bookkeeper that's like in Atlanta, Georgia or something. And this is what blows my mind is the, the biggest challenge that I feel like I run into as a leader is how do I, like you're not having everyone in the same office building every day. You don't have your vision statement on the wall and you know, you're, you're not, you're not able to walk by someone's office or cubicle and just say, hey, how are you doing? How was your weekend? You're, you're, you have to learn how to uh, manage vision and cast vision and culture when you only have like fragments of a fragment of time with each person every day. And that, you know, that's not going away. And so talk, like when you talk <laughs> about the, the issue with management, I mean, what's the solution? Is the solution to like to, to spend more time trying to do it? Or is it like embracing that it's never going to be the same? Or what do you think? Yeah. So a cu- couple of things I want to throw, throw out to you. The first is that a full remote experience is not the sweet spot, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I, tons of businesses are doing it, doing it well. Where do you lose? You lose in culture and you lose in the ability to truly come alongside in the same way as you could if you were in person, right? Mm. It's not that you can't, you just lose some of that. But what you gain is massive as well, right? So um, if, if I were to, to say the ideal world, it would be like 10% in person, 90% virtual, and that, that would address it. So so to answer your question more specifically, Cap, the, the, the reality is only the businesses that understand the title of manager always meant to manage. It always meant to lead. It never meant anything else. It mm-hmm. never meant sit in your office and play Tetris and tell people to do something, right? It never meant that. I'm being facetious and forgive me, I'm not all managers. Certainly most managers don't They're do They're probably that. playing Fortnite these days, not Tetris. Yeah, exactly, I should have said that because I'm a gamer <laughs> too. So, uh, the, the, so, so the only solution here is a change I want to say back, but let's not say back, a change to truly managing, a change to truly leading. And what does that look like today? It looks a little bit different, but the the key is not, well, tell me what leadership looks like so I can roll it out to my company. No, the key is what does Cap need? What does Steve need? And as a leader, I've got to figure that out for each person. That's where the lift comes in. So the idea of like, we're never going to get this figured out. No, the companies that aren't going to be around, and I'll tell you who they are, the Kodaks and the blockbusters of the world, and dare I say, companies like Major League Baseball, if they don't make some major shifts right now, um, I just did an article on Major League Baseball and the Indian Premier League cricket, it's called IPL, blow your mind. But um, if they don't start to make some of those changes, they're not gonna be around long enough. Well, two of them aren't, right? Blockbuster and Kodak, but I'm I was implying MLB. MLB have been talking about making changes for decades and we still to see them, right? But right now, 
their average viewership, 57 years old. They're still the second most valuable league in the world, NFL, MLB, I forget what's third right now, and then it's the Indian Premier Cricket League. Um, crazy. Maybe Premier Soccer so, 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 or Premier Football in, in Europe, would that be the no, third? EP, the English Premier League is actually fifth, I believe. So IPL, the Cricket League, is is only 12 years old, and it's more valuable than all these leagues. It's fascinating, fascinating wow. story. Interesting. So it, it, it's all to do with, um, yeah, it's a heavy lift, but if you do it, you're going to be on the other side. So uh, let me use a terrible example of COVID, right? So if you use COVID as a bad example, um, if you want to travel, you need to get a shot, right? Or as we've just seen with Djokovic in going to try and play the Australian Open, um, you may not be allowed to play, right? Now, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm not making a judgment call on the, That's not what this is about. But here's the point. In order for me to travel... I know that that's one of the things that's going to be a major barrier to entry. So I have to choose to either get a vaccination so I can travel or not, right? In the same way, you don't have to change your management style, your leadership style. But if you don't start to understand that there are aliens and their diet is different and to bring forth fruit in their lives is requires a different kind of management, a different kind of fertilizer, a different kind of watering, a different if you don't get that, well, that's okay. If you don't get the shot, you don't travel. If you don't change your management style, you don't get to lead because your company will leave and your business will, will at some point close. Most people, we believe and trust, they'll come to a point where they, it'll be an aha moment and you won't have to understand the next generation. It'll just be the norm again, like I was saying to you about uh, communication being so 35% uh, digital. At some point, it won't be this like fact that we talk about. Everybody will be 35, 40% digital communication, and then it'll be the norm. So the businesses that are raised up in this fourth industrial revolution, the businesses that raise up in Gen Z, where the world has already changed, can embrace the world much more easily. The ones that didn't have to make a change. <laughs> so look at the cars right now, look at cars. Um, more and more and more cars are coming out, uh, brands are coming out with electric cars. Um, at one point, it was like, oh, no, I'll never drive a car. Are you kidding me? I'm going to go by this horse. I'm driving. I'm going by a horse, right? Mm -hmm. Now, it's. I've, I've heard how many people say, I'll never drive an electric car. I'm, I've got a gas car. I've also heard people say, I'll never let it drive autonomously. All of that's going to happen, right? So it's just a case of how long does it take you to realize that it's going to happen and accept it and adjust your life accordingly. What's so interesting about the automobile analogy was that or observation is that i mean for so long even in my short life 29 years of living i've i've seen that it's been almost impossible for a new car company to break into the industry it's like these ones are established these are the players some are way better than others but this is this is the the set of options and then tesla they came in and they completely disrupted that not only are they a new car company but they are like the car company, they are, you know, the luxurious electric car. And then I just heard about this car company called Rivion. They're like doing like electric pickups. And now I'm just thinking like, holy cow, like these, now there's companies come out of, out of the woodwork because, you know, because everything is shifting completely. It's, it's, there's a, it's truly a transformation in the market. It's fascinating. And what you'll see, Cap, is that, you know, the biggest the biggest pushback originally, not originally, recently, was, oh, you know, there's not enough charging stations and what happens if I go from here right. to Atlanta and da, 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 da. Once that tipping point is reached, you'll see how quickly that infrastructure gets built, right? So it's like, oh, there's not enough infrastructure. When the first people got their cell phones, right, it was like, well, what are you doing with it? There's not a lot of people to speak to on the phone. Well, you could call landlines, but then if someone was in the office, it's like, ah, oh, so why have you got this, you know, cell phone? Well, how's it? Okay, look where we are today, right? And, and so I think that mindset, uh, what happens if Kodak, and they had an opportunity apparently, bought Instagram, the data around that will blow your mind at the time when Kodak went bankrupt, how many employees they had, what they could have bought Instagram for, and what Instagram's worth today. Missed it completely, right? You, 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 look, at, you look at Blockbuster and Netflix, same story. They could have, they didn't, and look what happened, I right? Know. And so, you know, that natural selection, as it were, is brutal and real. But I think when we talk about kingdom, um, the reality for me from a kingdom perspective is, yeah, this 
I, I, I get to speak to businesses. I get to, to, to work in that space. I, I, I apply this stuff to our business. Um, I get to speak to parent groups. I get to speak to kids. I get to speak to churches, which is all awesome, right? But at the end of the day, my heart is to see that we don't lose an entire generation. And when you start to unpack the data around spirituality, church, in this generation, you'll see how urgent this matter really, really is, right? And so um, the, the underlying motive in my heart is just to stir people's perspective and insight into how amazing this generation is. And as part of calling them forward or forth, um, you know, from a Christian perspective, that is going after their hearts. And so the, the true issue that we're dealing with with this generation is single. It's, well, there's actually four things, but because remember I said there's 16, so there's, there's a lot of fours that go on. <laughs> but um, the, 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 one of the core issues is identity. We have a real identity issue. And while there's an identity issue, you, you cannot be who you call, well, you're not who you call to be, right? So, um, so true. from a business perspective, it's a little bit different, you know, in terms of leaders understanding this whole SOS GPS kind of concept. So that's from the older generations. That's one of the key factors. From the from Gen Z, it's really around, you know, the four things. I'll tell you what they are. The, the um, we're talking about pride and self, right? Since day one, Gen Z has been brought up um, as CEOs of their own lives. What would you like? When would you like it? How would you like it? Here it is. Here's access to data. You, you have you have everything at your fingertips, right? So they, they have the sense of self. Um, how do I want it? When do I want it? And so they, they graduate college, go into the workplace, and all of a sudden someone's telling them what to do. And they're like, wait, what? <laughs> no, that's never happened in my life. Why is it going to happen now? So that whole pride and concept of self um, is, is it, I, I call them the, the giants that that they have to navigate, right? And so that's one of the, the spiritual giants. The second one is fear. We're in a fear-based lifestyle. Um, and that ties into that world news thing I told you about earlier. The third is identity. And the fourth, not, not in any particular order, is this, we're a fatherless generation, right? So right. they're yeah, a fatherless a generation. One. So they're statistically fatherless and or parentless. So I don't just mean the dad. I mean the dad, the mom, and or both parents in the home and not, not parenting. So we're a fatherless generation, but it's not just that, it's the fatherless generation this way. And so if you're not connected to the father this way, certainly your identity is not established. And if your identity is not established, fear and pride just take over and run rampant, right? And so you look at the data that tracks around um, suicide and, and uh, the, the, all the things in terms of loneliness, suicide, um, depression, anxiety, those things off the charts. And you're, I, I don't want to simplify because it it's not simple, right? But a lot of those roots come out of identity and fatherless, fatherlessness and, and fear. And if you only have two options, right? You have faith or fear. Those are the only two options. You can live in fear or faith. And so if you don't have that spiritual connection, the default is fear, right? So mm -hmm. you, 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 you're on a journey here to, to in, in my heart, you're on a journey an urgent journey to catch a generation because we could lose in a generate an entire generation. I know God's greater than that, um, but He also calls us to play a part in this journey, and and I think that's one significant part we play. Man, Steve, I I wish that this was the Joe Rogan experience because then we could talk for three hours. But um, we're coming up to the end of our time, and I'm just like I feel like we're just scratching the tip of the iceberg. So we might need to just get you on for a second. A second episode to go a little bit deeper and you know I can hear you clicking because I know like you're pulling up a lot of you know you're so well prepared guys if it, you need to go follow Steve because he is he's truly a thought leader in this area God has really gifted him with you know not just instinct about what's happening but even like as you're as you're you're codifying here's the 16 uh things that go into this or here's the four the four factors of, of like the perfect storm that we're in god has given you just such an a, a an amazing gift in actually measuring and making this thing attainable and practical for for us and i really believe that if if we as the church don't grasp this we're missing a major opportunity. And I love the I love how you, you qualified it with the recognition that God's bigger, God's sovereign, but at the same time, he wants to move in the earth and he wants to move in the earth through you and me. He's called us to be a part of this. And I think um, one thing that sticks out to me, Steve, from scripture is when Jesus 
would go and he would speak to the crowds. One thing that, that always catch, catches my attention is that he always spoke to the crowds in a parable and he never spoke without a parable. This is what it says in Matthew chapter 13. And, and in his parables, he, these stories that he spoke, he could have talked about carpentry. We know that he was a carpenter. I can't recall a single parable documented in scripture where he talked about carpentry. He talked about banking and baking and fishing and farming and looking for a lost coin and looking for a lost sheep and looking for a lost son. He was never a shepherd. He was never going to get married. And he wasn't a father of like an earthly son. And yet you have this, the son of God, the savior of the world. He inconvenienced himself to speak the language of the people that he was talking to. He got into their world. He crafted stories about what they were interested in and what their worldview was. He didn't just come from this lens of all I know is carpentry. I'm going to give you carpentry stories. He got into their world. And what I see you doing is you're helping a, you're helping a generation of kingdom builders really come back into alignment with, with the empathetic heart of our father who is like, you know what? I'm going to be all things to all men. I'm going to understand their worldview. Even if I have to learn a whole new language, I'm going to go into that world and I'm going to, uh, and I want to build a bridge. And so Steve, as we close, I'd love for you to pray for us. I'd love for you to pray for you, for me, for anybody listening, it's for Gen Z, for, for, for Christians today in general, that we don't miss this opportunity. This is an opportunity. This isn't just like a big problem in front of us. This is a tremendous opportunity to see a, 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 what I believe is probably the biggest global harvest we've ever seen. And uh, what was us if we miss it? So could you pray for that for us? I would, I would love to. Thanks for having me on, Cap. I appreciate that. So uh, praying would be, a, be my, my pleasure. Lord, we, we're so grateful for this time together. We're so grateful for any and all that have a chance to listen to this. And I think above everything, Lord, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would pull from all this conversation back and forth those things that are important to our hearts to, one, see a generation through your eyes. We know they're different, Lord. We know you've created them differently. We know your heart is passionately going after them. And we pray that you would let us see them through your eyes. When we see them through your eyes, Father God, it changes our perspective. And I, I love to say this, only once your perspective changes will your behavior change. Mm. It always precedes a change in behavior. And Lord, and we just release that yep. over everybody that's listening today. And Father God, we just thank you that whether people that are listening are Gen Z, whether they're parenting, whether they're leaders, whether they're in business, whether they're business owners, or whether they're in the church, Lord God, that you would break their hearts mm. for this generation because it's only when our motives are truly pure like mm. this that you go after a generation without ceasing lord and we just thank you for divine insights divine wisdom divine opportunities to impact come alongside and run with this generation lord i really celebrate and believe that this billion soul harvest that we've heard so much about starts with gen z wow. and as you show us always in the story of Lazarus. Lazarus was raised from the dead. How awesome was that? But if you look at what happened to Mary, her life was crazy rocked, right? And I believe that that's, that, that is a parallel. Gen Z are going to be the ones that are going to reach the other generations for the kingdom. And so, Father, we want to go after them with hearts that are to please you, with motives that are to please you. And, Father, to reach a generation that could be lost because the enemy is going after them mm. in a way that we haven't seen before. Lord, we just release a peace and a love and a passion and an excitement over this generation. Yep. And we thank you, Father, that you stir our hearts because when you stir our hearts, they stay stirred and we are open and excited for that. Thank you, Father, for every single person listening. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Steve, you're the man. How, how can people follow along with your story? Um, wow, probably easiest is to find me on Instagram um, and on my website. Instagram is, I think, uh, at Stephen underscore J underscore Robertson. Sorry, it's clumsy. It's the website. <laughs> um, but my personal website, StephenJRobertson.com. So that's easy. Or just through you, just connect. And please, I, I love connecting with people. It's one of the passions God's given me. So if anybody's interested in connecting and chatting, I, that would be an absolute pleasure for me. Cool. 
Steve, thank you so much for joining us on Directed Life today. This was a treasure. Appreciate you. Thank you so much, my friend.